try to leave that door open. Um, if it gets to be too much, somebody over there wave their hand and close it. Um, plus, it's kind of cool when people see what's going on uh, over on the sidewalk. Um, so anyway, uh, my name is Matt Gifford. I'm one of the organizers from Old Portland. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, how many of you? This is your first time at a Old Portland meeting. Wow! <laughs> I said this last, last month too. It's, it's crazy. It's happened to every single one. Um, so that was, I don't know, two thirds of it at least. So, um, so we're all about mobile. Um, every quarter we try to do a social, a tech, and a business. Uh, this one's going to be tech. Uh, we're being the second quarter. Uh, we meet the fourth Monday of every month, not the last Monday. I think. Um, so. The, Day varies quite a bit. Um, so, White Monday, we're modeled after an organization called Mobile Mondays. Um, we're not affiliated with them because Jason says they would never answer our calls. Um, <laughs> so, we went ahead anyway. Uh, website's mobileportland.com. And uh, we have a Google group. Um, if you want to uh, participate in discussions, find somebody to help you with your project or your problem or whatever. Um, we also have a mailing list that you can sign up for. Um, it's two or three messages a month, basically just announcements about me. So. And we have a Twitter account at mobile. Uh, so here's the events uh, coming up. Um, so tonight, what's going on in wireless? Uh, this coming weekend, Startup Weekend Portland, Mobilism, a couple more of our meetings. Open Source Bridge is in June. OzCon is in July. Um, and then the last thing on the list is our meeting for July. My guess is that we'll move it to coincide with uh, OzCon, because we usually manage to get some really cool people for that meeting. It's not that there are people in here. So thanks to our sponsors, Urban Airship and Cloud4. Um, I think I'm the only one from Cloud4 here. Uh, is there anybody from Urban Airship that would like to get up and talk about jobs or anything like that? No? Okay. So this is uh, the portion of the meeting where we do job openings, announcements, that sort of thing. Um, we don't have a wireless mic tonight, so if you want to queue up over here uh, and make your announcement, that would be Yeah. <laughs> um, my name is Ted Baldry. I work for a company called Soft Source Consulting. Um, we're, we're mainly a, a .NET um, development group. I, I'm actually part of a, a small mobile group that's right here. But our main need is actually uh, we're looking for um, uh, C Sharp .NET developers. And I realize that may not be a lot of, a lot of uh, this group potentially. But I also know developers, and we're actually offering a, a finder fee if you have friends that might be interested, um, a 64 gig uh, iPad. And, um, and if you're interested, you can find me afterwards. Basically, it's just uh, um, experience in, in C Sharp, uh, .NET 5 plus years experience. Great. Uh, I was hoping to have some time and benefit to watch everybody else know to do this so I know how to do it. But hey, um, I'm with, my name is Stephen Eager. I'm with a company that's called Spherical Apps. And we are trying to put together four mobile apps, a suite of four mobile apps for data collection, engineering, field engineering. That's really the broad spectrum of what we're doing. I can get into details with somebody, anybody who's out here in Portland. We're trying to keep everything local as far as finding our developers. I've talked with people that are from, you know, New York and San Francisco and all over, of course, but it would really be nice to have somebody right here. Uh, we're getting ready to put out an RFP probably in two days' time on Wednesday, and we're going to send it both electronically and uh, by mail. We've got about, I don't know, 400 pages of wireframes and RFP address. It just kind of explains what the details of what we're doing. And I am interested in finding anybody in Portland, if you guys know anybody or if you are somebody that can write some complicated apps. Thanks. Dave Powell, um, 
at Avatron Software. And we're hiring folks who do iOS development, Android development, we need a project manager, and um, UX design help. So we're doing a lot of hiring right now. We, we do their apps, air display, and air sharing, um, one of which makes your iPad or Android tablet into a second monitor for your computer. A bunch of other stuff. And we're doing some contract work too, so there's a lot of work coming up. Testing, 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 testing. This is pretty good. You guys can hear? Is that better? All right. My name is Nate De Niro, and I'm with Elastic Health. Uh, I'm a recruiter, and I've got lots of jobs available. Actually, 350 or more in health IT, if that's what you're into. Uh, and I also find people. So if you're looking for people and you can't find them, I've got a huge database of people uh, in all kinds of disciplines. So. I'll be here. Anybody else? <laughs> so the topic for this month is what's going on in wireless. If you're confused about you know, which LTE you're going to be using in which place, anything like that, um, this should answer your questions. Our speaker tonight is Rob Wilcox. Carried on 
since. As a result of that work, I got to work on elections in South Africa, Sierra Leone, and Kazakhstan, uh, working up from a very technical kind of disaster recovery IT level up to really looking at uh, democracy and society. So uh, that's kind of where I come from. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the radio spectrum. And uh, I'm going to pass around this uh, copy of it with a little magnifying glass. I don't, really expect, <laughs> I don't really expect you to understand this chart. If you go home and uh, pull it down from the internet, I think you'll see some very interesting things. It's, it's good for, I can tell you, it's good for hours and hours of entertainment. <laughs> Now, how, how many people here have heard of Edward Tufte? Have you heard of Edward Tufte? This is the perfect Edward Tufte chart. Which means it's impossible to get anything from it in PowerPoint. But let me just uh, talk about something that's not here. Okay, first, uh, this chart was put together uh, by the Department of Commerce, right? That's the one that everybody wants to eliminate. So they do useful things. Okay, second, this part here is the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So down on the far left side here is, is audio, right? And then you kind of get, here's the radio spectrum. Here's infrared. You kind of go up through x-rays, cosmic rays, and that sort of thing. So we're going to be talking about this part here. Next thing is, uh, this is a log chart, so each section starts with a low frequency, goes to a high frequency. But that means that, so this, this goes from uh, 300 kilohertz up to, I'm sorry, 30 kilohertz up to 300. 3 megahertz up to 30 megahertz. So what that means is that uh, the same amount of space here is a very small space here. So you've got to translate in your mind, but you can't really draw this chart otherwise. Uh, another thing we can talk about is there's a very small print, which of course you can't see, and these are the uh, instrumentation, scientific, and medical bands. Those are airwaves that the FCC has said uh, Anybody can use for anything as long as the transmitters are within certain ranges and specifications. So, what's the use of that? Well, that's where Wi Fi lives. And the amount of space that's dedicated to instrumentation, scientific, and medical is tiny. It's tiny. And uh, so, that's a problem. The other thing is these big blue areas here are uh, broadcasting, television and radio. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion about maybe uh, taking some of that and reusing it for uh, mobile applications. So we've already done some of that. Right in here is the famous 700 megahertz band. Uh, so there's interesting things going on there. Again, in the sort of tufty view of the world of how to make a chart, this little band along the bottom of the, uh, each uh, section of the spectrum. And that says whether that spectrum is dedicated to commercial use exclusively, the government use exclusively, or share between government and the military, or I'm sorry, the government and commercial, or in many cases, between the military and commercial. Uh, so, and then finally, a lot of the spectrum is used for multiple uses. So if there's a strike ban, that means that there are several different uses allowed uh, depending on the location and license applications. And then the final thing is that the really great area of the spectrum for what we're talking about, mobile applications, is pretty much, let's say, I say between here and about there. That's what we've got to work with. And finally, there's a lot of really great uses here that no one's going to give up. 
first they've already got the licenses and the right to use them, and they can protect that, you know, through lobbying processes. But we really don't want to give up radio navigation for ships and planes, right? We don't want to give up uh, being able to do uh, measure the radio waves that come off the of stars. We just had this case with uh, the, the uh, is it Light Square? Was the, there was a uh, company that owned Spectrum used to for satellite communications. They said, well, why don't we also build mobile land stations using that same spectrum. Well, the problem is that a satellite signal, by the time it reaches the Earth, is extremely weak, much stronger than a radio uh, signal that comes from a cell tower that's a mile away. And then there's the whole GPS problem. So this is all decided by meetings at the ITU internationally country by country, in meetings every few years, and it changes very slowly. We're starting to change it more quickly, but there's a, a maximum rate at which this can change. So, um, as I say, this is good for hours and hours of entertainment at home. Uh, I think we'll kind of hold the questions to the end, but try to, you know, make a note, and because uh, then we'll, we'll do the mic thing. So I won't say any questions. On this. Okay, now, there's a lot of mystique and terminology about radio, but it's actually very simple. And in our mobile world, we usually use two different schemes. One is called frequency division duplexing, and the other is called time division duplexing. What does that mean? It means with frequency division duplexing, which is the most common system of use, there's one set of frequencies used for tower to phone communication, and a different set of frequencies separate off, you know, in uh, frequency for the phone to tower communications. And the reason is that it makes the radio engineering easier because the transmitting isn't interfering with the receiving, especially in the phone, which is a little, you know, it's a very small space in there, right? But the way these bands have been allocated is that we're using the same amount of uh, bandwidth for uplink as we are for downlink. But most of our traffic is from the internet to us, not the other way around. So we're wasting a lot. So that was the idea of uh, time vision duplexing. You kind of, sometimes you're transmitting and sometimes you're receiving. And that allows a dynamic allocation of bandwidth between uplink and downlink based on what's actually needed by the subscribers. Uh, an example is uh, some AT&T bands that go from 1850 megahertz to 1910 for the uplink and 1930 to 1990 for the downlink. They don't use all that, which is another problem. Uh, compared to uh, Clearwire, when they were operating, was using time division duplexing, and they could actually dynamically allocate the channel between uplink and downlink for that base station sector. So, the point of this is I believe TDD is a lot more valuable, but most of the spectrum has already been allocated on an FDD basis. So we'll kind of see how that nets out in the long term. Uh, second thing is, modern radio technology combines a whole series of individual transmissions to build up into a good size high bandwidth channel. And there's a lot of <coughs> possibility to you know, expand the capacity of radio networks by this technology. And then finally, when you have a base station, a lot of times they'll take the frequencies they've been allocated, break that to smaller channels, and use different channels pointing in different directions. So what you're worried about as a subscriber is how much bandwidth you're getting in the sector where you are for that base station. 
And if there's a lot of people in your sector because Timbers Game just got out, right, you're not going to get a lot of bandwidth. If you're at home in a very remote place but happen to be near a cell tower, you're going to get it all. The other point is that I showed you on the map the good frequencies. You don't want a frequency so low that you need a giant antenna to pick it up if you've got a little small phone, right? If you're in your car, you can have a giant antenna. And in fact, if you're receiving FM on your little you know, mobile device, a lot of times they're using the uh, earphone wire as the antenna because the FM band has a huge wavelength. And then you, you don't want to be too high because the higher you go in frequency, the more difficult it is for the radio waves to get through walls, especially concrete walls or steel walls. And the lower frequencies tend to sort of bend around obstacles. It's, it's hard to visualize, but it does really happen. So even though there's a vast spectrum that I showed on the other page, there's a sweet spot, and that's why all those uses are concentrated in that, that area. Uh, so finally, this is actually a spectrum graph. Uh, one of, the, of these will be the transmit, one receive, and then there's kind of a blank space in between. So if you were to go out with a, uh, an analyzer in the world and look at what's actually being used, most of what's licensed and allocated is not being used in a, any given place at any given time. So again, there's a lot more possibilities for getting <coughs> more use out of the radio waves that we already have. I think I'm finished with the most technical part of the talk. <laughs> um, so one of the things that's come up in politics now is, is there a spectrum shortage? Uh, and there's good arguments different ways. You could say, yes, there's a, a spectrum shortage because there are all these new uses and every laptop's going to come with a, a 4G modem in it and everybody is going to be sitting in a coffee shop watching HD movies on their laptop. None of them the same, of course, right? And so obviously we need more spectrum to deal with the, these use cases. Uh, but I really believe that it's a problem of timing because there, is, there are ways to expand wireless bandwidth by making smaller cells or adding uh, new uh, frequencies on base stations. The problem is the speed at which carriers can do that, right? Because they've got, you know, low tens of thousands of base stations, each with at least three sectors. So you're talking about a lot of people going out and replacing equipment. Then they've got phones in their network with all these different bands that they've used in the past, and those phones kind of age out over a period of time. Uh, and then finally, they've got all their licensing things and all their capital expenses of financing this. So you find that every carrier will have like a very complex roadmap mapping this out, and of course they're sharing it with the the phone makers, but the phone makers want to inject a new phone into the market and sell a huge number very quickly. So I would say that we're going to have kind of a lumpy uh, upgrade cycle to deal with changes in the subscriber technology versus how quickly the network and government policy can change on spectrum. But uh, it is, uh, you know, the carriers do have spectrum they're not using. So the question is, do they have enough? Can they move into that quickly enough? It's kind of sad to me that AT&T doesn't have LTE in Portland. I don't even know where we're going to get it. Um, the other thing you can do is to um, go to smaller cells, but that means more towers and more expense. Or femto cells, a little cell in your home or your office that has a connection to your broadband network, like fiber. And so you're interacting with that rather than the tower half a mile away. Uh, the other thing that I think is very interesting, and it, it involves Oregon, is that uh, now Congress has gotten involved in the spectrum planning. 
Uh, and some people say that uh, that's a bad thing. Depends on how you feel about Congress. I can pray agree there. But obviously, the government's always been involved in spectrum planning. Um, the congressman from Eastern Oregon, which is actually about three quarters of Oregon on the map, Greg Walden, is the chair of the House Committee that is writing a new FCC bill. He'll basically turn over a television spectrum to mobile operators uh, in exchange for the mobile operators buying from the government and the television uh, stations selling it to the government. And this is part of uh, a possibility to balance the budget. So we've got actually an Oregon congressman very much involved in quite a few details of carrier operations, spectrum, and how that influences your mobile devices. I think we should probably get find a staffer there and maybe have them come to uh, mobile Portland. Uh, I tell them it's difficult. And uh, it's one of the things that needs to move a lot faster than the government. <coughs> uh, and there should be a lot more, I believe there should be a lot more engineers as FCC commissioners rather than attorneys. So my personal, personal opinion, not the opinion of mobile Portland. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually quite a little. Uh, so, once you've got that spectrum, how do you use it? There are actually a very small number of radio technologies used by our phones today, even worldwide. There was one system uh, devised by Qualcomm, and they were very early wireless innovators. And then when they moved from analog technology to digital technology, they formed their own standards group. Uh, called 3G PP2. So their family is the CDMA family. Uh, in Europe, the GSM family uh, was run by, it's, it's, it's an international group, so they're American, Japanese, and Chinese, Australians involved as well, but it's centered out of Europe. They have the, the GSM family, so they started out with analog technology, and then they have all a series of digital uh, transitions. Then there was another group, uh, WiMAX, that came out of work at the IEEE, which is a group of electrical engineers. And there's a whole series of standards that they work on. Bluetooth came from them, Wi-Fi came from them. So they're a powerful standards force. Then kind of overarching all that is something called uh, IMT Advanced. So the ITU, which is responsible for radio spectrum worldwide, and they're based in Europe, they're essentially part of the UN, uh, has decreed that all of these technologies in order to be called IMT advanced, or really high bandwidth designation, have to meet certain criteria. So each of these in its own way is moving toward the IMT advanced requirements, which means uh, a lot of no, I will discuss that. So, uh, this is one of the CDMA roadmaps. Uh, they're continuing on, uh, and they're heavily used in China. Although China has their own slightly different version, and they're scattered around the world. The, the Verizon network is mostly uh, CDMA. GSM, uh, they're the ones that, that won out with LTE standard. Of course, AT&T uses uh, uh, GSM standards. Uh, so they have a whole sequence of things. And if you know, if you, you know, your carrier will tell you, oh, we've got the this, that, and the other. So you'll see several carriers. You know, many carriers actually have all three of these networks simultaneously operating and your phone will migrate to them. So GSM, I think, is that SIM card? Is that the non-SIM card? The, the, the SIM card is, uh, crosses all the technologies that that comes in. Now, WiMAX was um, devised to provide an alternate to Qualcomm technology because uh, Qualcomm was collecting royalties from a lot of their 
IP. And so this group that started this wanted to build a system that would be independent of the Qualcomm IP and uh, made a lot of the early advances in uh, what we would call 4G technology now. In other words, a network where everything travels over uh, IP packets like the internet from the phone all the way to the end node you're talking to. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, this has moved, they kind of missed their market window, and it's now used for uh, machine to machine communication, so if we want to read power meters and that sort of thing, that seems to be the application it's falling into now. Uh, there are probably also some point to point applications. So it was a good technical effort, but Business-wise, it wasn't as successful as it could have been. On the other hand, uh, the talk that they generated uh, changed the IP uh, environment for LTE. So there's not as much Qualcomm IP in LTE as a result of this effort. So uh, it's kind of an interesting kind of technology business intersection that was partially successful and partially not. Great technology. Okay, so LTE, that's the answer. Everything's going to be LTE, right? Uh, you won't be able to see this here, but this is from the LTE standard. There are 26 FDD bands that are designated as standards. And different countries use different ones. And in fact, some places will even swap uh, uplink and downlink within that band. So there's uh, quite a few different standards. And then there's 11 TDD bands. So in other words, that spectrum that everything you transmit receives in one block, not split. Finally, the standard allows different size channels. Uh, 1.4 megahertz, 3, 5, 10, 15, 20, there'll probably be uh, additional ones added, both in bands and channels. Uh, and then China, actually they just, I think this past month, signed an agreement on uh, IP, I can't remember exactly what the, the details were, but in the past China has kind of gone its own way uh, trying to avoid licensing costs uh, for a good reason, because it's cheaper. Uh, now it looks like they're uh, willing to negotiate by very aggressively some licensing costs to use the standard technology. But my prediction is eventually China will go its entirely own way and develop its own standard because of its market power and its own internal uh, so, hard to, hard to say, but uh, I will keep an eye on that. So the point is, I think this is the next slide. Is that going to change how uh, phones would be to how any device would be built versus the Chinese? Actually, people can do that at the end. I can barely hear you, and then we're going to have people come up and ask questions. Okay, so we can with that. Yeah. I, normally, I would jump in. But, um, okay. For the phone to be compatible with the carrier, it has to use the same radio technology, you know, uh, LTE, CDMA, and so forth. It has to use the same frequency bands. It has to have the same number of carrier and the same channel bandwidth within those frequency bands. And then within the radio, there are a huge number of sort of software handshakes that occur. So those all have to be uh, and then, it, as you go up the layers of software within the phone, there's even more. So the point is that it's very difficult to make the world phone that really works on every carrier everywhere, even if people wanted to. Uh, it would be nice, though. It would be sensible. Now, how do we get to this point? Um, if you look at the wireless uh, ecosystem, the first stage of it is research. So you have our uh, 
internationally funded groups like the EU research agenda. In the United States, you have uh, for defense DARPA, a couple of other entities funding wireless research. Some carriers will fund wireless research in universities. Uh, there's some kind of independent research entities like Fraunhofer Labs, that sort of thing. Uh, so you have a lot of money, enough money, to do research on you know, what the future problems are, what the capabilities of radios that are needed, how do we solve those problems. Generally, the decisions on what to fund are made by uh, committees of university professors and researchers. So they all kind of say, well, what's the problem? And then they say, okay, we need to solve this problem. And then they allocate money to themselves to do that research. And generally, I think it works pretty well. The other part of this is the standards committee. So these are groups that meet a couple times a year, usually in a hotel somewhere. It moves all over the world. And in between, they send emails to each other, kind of debating what should be in the spec. And then a few people step forward and start actually writing the spec. And then there are a lot of uh, both technical and political discussions about what should be in the spec and how it should be. So that's why, for instance, the LTE spec had all that uh, diversity. And uh, there are good technical reasons for things to be in the spec. There are a lot of business reasons that, are, that uh, cause things to be in specs. And usually the specs are very complex and very adaptable, but that uh, means that in order to use them, you have to make specific decisions about configuration. Once the spec is uh, getting frozen, people start building into equipment. They uh, have these things called plug fests, and I believe that it was a guy in Beaverton who invented this term. And they, they bring millions of dollars worth of equipment to the hotel ballroom somewhere, wherever, Las Vegas or Atlanta or Hawaii. And they drink a lot of carbonated sodas and they'll actually take a base station, the actual equipment, and instead of using an antenna connected by a wire to a phone, and then they'll say, hey, can we talk? And then, no, it's not working. So then they gotta dig into the software and figure out what's not working. So it's a really interesting process, and it's, that's just the first step of compatibility. And I think that it's done in such a kind of hands-on, hardware way, and these people stay up, you know, 24 by 7 uh, doing these things. I think it's very fascinating. Uh, then the equipment goes into the carrier labs, where each phone is tested against the base station configuration and systems for the carrier. And then finally it gets released in the wild, and usually that phone works. You know, there's, I haven't heard of a protocol incompatibility in the released phone because of all this that we go through. But remember, this process here could be five years, right? So is this process capable of handling the kind of innovation that you, as application developers, are bringing into the system? I think that's the interesting question. This, by the way, is uh, Apple's test lab. And if you sit in a seat and use a phone, there's a whole series of sensors around it actually mapping your uh, radio field. So the reason that all this technology is changing so quickly is that we're in this kind of exponential growth curve of new applications, uh, each one of us. There are a couple of different mobile uh, patterns. Uh, you have fully mobile where you're walking down the street or driving in a car. And I remember working on some of this wireless technology before we talking about what if you're flying in a, a plane at 700 miles an hour or 300 miles an hour. That makes certain demands on the radio technology. Or nomadic, that's you're sitting in a coffee shop, you're not moving, right? And your, your machine or you're sitting talking on your phone in a fixed spot. How that interacts with the radio network is different than the first case. 
And then finally, maybe you're just at home, right? And you're not even walking around the house. This is sort of the clear water model. You've got this little pond and window pointing to the base station. And uh, the kind of broadband connection you have then has a certain impact on the radio network. So generally, we're building radio networks that can handle all things. Another thing that's changing is, used to be in the old, old voice world, when you talked into the phone, your voice was converted to a bitstream, and it was a constant bitstream, it didn't change. It may have silent suppression, you know, when you stop talking, it's not transmitting or it's transmitting empty frames. But as we move to internet voice and internet applications and larger tablets and uh, laptops, we're generating more bursty traffic, which puts a certain load on the network that wasn't there before. It may not be always there, but the fact that it's bursty is a special challenge. The other thing we're seeing is uh, streaming uh, audiovisual applications. And if you're just looking at a little picture on your phone uh, of a sports game, that's not a lot of bandwidth, right? But if you're transmitting an HD stream, it is. Uh, the other thing that's really interesting is when you're talking about AV, if you're, you have a lot of time uh, to prepare the media, and a lot of time to decode it on the end plane, you can compress it very efficiently. It's great. But if you're doing real-time video conferencing, where you can't delay to do high-quality compression, you're going to waste bandwidth of the network. So, streaming AV is going to be a much greater demand on the network than what's called. Or, for instance, web surfing, where generally you make a request and something comes down, and then you study it for a while and think about it. And act upon it. Uh, personal video conferencing, that's the one, especially if you get up into higher fidelity, that could really uh, put a good load on the network because you can't spend time with rest of And then, you know, of course, anything you do in media, you can use for advertising. So, advertising, you know, media in advertising could potentially become interesting. You know, maybe you know, if you saw the, the Super Bowl and the Bears drinking Coke, right? What if they were interacting with you individually, right? What would that take? or if they were a little bit more realistic, realistically uh, rendered. Here's some more examples. Um, Korea actually leads the United States in mobile use cases. They've had a mobile broadband for longer. In fact, their uh, standard preceded WiMAX and fed into a lot of the ideas we there's actually a huge problem of uh, internet gaming addiction in Korea. So if you really want to study what's going on in mobile, Korea is a very interesting place to look uh, if you're looking at highly developed societies. This is a very interesting space here. Uh, simulation, virtual worlds, virtual reality. So just think about it, if you, I'm sure you know Second Life or Sim City. The idea is that back in the cloud you have a huge database and a gaming engine on your mobile node renders out a scene based on today a relatively compact transmission between that database and your display. If you're talking about a, a social game, right? The database includes all the scenery in the game all the objects in the game, and all the characters in the game. But what if you're using that same technology to teach science in the school? And instead of that chemistry lab, remember in like seventh or eighth grade, right, you had the beakers and we're setting things on fire. If you're doing that kind of learning in a simulated environment, and you're of course going to be doing it mobile, right? So that's a very interesting use case, and I don't know yet what the uh, 
bandwidth demands are going to be for that. Uh, but I think it's a really good exploration area. Telemedicine uh, for emergencies, right? You're racing to the hospital and the ambulance. Does the ambulance have an x-ray machine in it? Right? Could, could in the future. Right? Certainly it's going to be sending your vital signs. Um, or maybe you're in the airport and you want to get your board, right? You want to get a checkup rather than get a, a burger, right? You kind of walk up and see your credit card and some shit. Am I healthy? Right? What can you tell me? Or maybe all those sensors are on your body, constantly gathering information. Or if you're a person who has a health problem, maybe they're sending that back to somebody to kind of keep an eye on them. So I would say today, uh, telemedicine use cases were at the very early stage of understanding what they can use for and what we require to make them happen. But certainly, there's a huge amount of funding going into that, and it's a potentially more economically efficient way to provide health care in a lot of the ways we do it today for certain things. So a very interesting space. Language translation, we already have that now. Uh, we're going to get more. It's a difficult problem with speaker independence. And um, today, the way it's done doesn't require a lot of network bandwidth, right? You capture a sound sample, it gets shipped up to the cloud, gets compared in parallel to a whole series of alternatives, and one of those comes back as the translation, right? We could have, you could translate your menu with a camera phone, you could translate voice, you could have uh, simultaneous translation. And I heard a few years ago that, uh, this is quite a lot, uh, it's either NTT or NEC in Japan, had an office, two-person office of the 100-year plan to look at where the company needed to go in order to you know, solve those problems. And the dream of the CEO that set up this office was the simultaneous phone translation. You could call anybody in the world, you could talk in your language, and they would talk in their language, and it would be translated uh, back and forth. So I don't think that it's not clear yet what kind of network demand that's going to take, but really interesting use case. Uh, Internet of Things is one of those great terms and extremely fuzzy, so it's great because it's everything to anybody, right? Or everything to everything to everybody, right? Um, that generally, though, it means a large number of things, but generally small rates. Uh, So some things are coming. Uh, mobile is a backbone for on-body systems and sensors. Uh, mesh networks. Uh, I talked to a gentleman who had been in Iran in, I believe it was uh, 19, 2002 or 2003. And teens there were using Bluetooth texting peer-to-peer, -peer, just in the neighborhood, to uh, communicate with each other sort of under the eyes of the moral police. So a lot of good thinking and research on mesh networks, when it's going to roll out and where, don't know yet. This is a Qualcomm thing they announced last year and it was some use cases, but I haven't heard anything from them. We'll see peer-to-peer -peer apps just like we have now in you know, our uh, wired network world. <laughs> Uh, in-vehicle apps will probably be in-vehicle app stores, right? Uh, so you're downloading something into your dashboard system. Uh, smart cities is uh, an idea. It's basically uh, government IT in service of better communication and lower, with the citizens and lower costs. And that involves you know, automating your traffic lights and light rail and providing traffic information, that sort of thing. A lot of what I talked about is sort of the technology view. What's possible with new technology coming? Uh, for application developers, a couple of ideas here. One is um, sometimes when you're in the sweet spot of the cell sector and you're the only one, you're going to have a ton of bandwidth available. 
But other times, you're going to be disconnected from the network, or you're going to be sharing that cell with a lot of people. So when you design an application, you have to cover both use cases, right? And provide a good customer experience in either case. Because in general, the wireless networks will always be congested at some point, whereas the wired networks are not. Um, there are going to probably be some incompatible standards for personal area networks and APIs for a while, but if you want to communicate with body sensors for your mobile device and use that as the backhaul back to the network to do something, uh, interesting space to watch. Uh, power consumption is always a concern. Uh, yes, a pad has a bigger battery, and a laptop has an even bigger battery, but there's always going to be a limit to what you can do on a handheld device that fits in your pocket. Uh, and so you have to be aware of that. And security is always going to be an issue and it's going to get worse. So it's just, you have to deal with it. Um, the other way to look at this is like, look at what is going on in society out in the future. And what are those people going to demand to solve their problems or change their lives? So this is a little speculative, but I think it's pretty solid, nonetheless. Uh, first, with our social networks, you're going to have a set of friends from kindergarten to the time you die. How many people is that? Right. How are you going to electronically manage that relationship and make it useful? In the past, uh, our aesthetics, what we think of as beautiful, valuable, useful, a good brand, has heavily been influenced by broadcast media. But in the future, it could be determined by what your friends think at all the different stages of your life, what good is, what cool is, what's a good company, what's good music, What's good art? Everything in aesthetics, I think eventually, will shift over to be formed by our social groups. The other thing I've noticed is a lot of our applications today, for instance, Twitter, are, they're kind of, they're a write once application. The person writes them, the, the information sends it out, uh, some of their friends read it, and then it kind of disappears. I mean, it's there, sometimes searchable. But it, it really isn't, uh, we don't make much use of it. And, and those, the design of those applications primarily depend on the fact that most people using them will kind of remember, because they have a good memory at age 15, right? Or age 25, for what happened, and they're able to recall it through their, you know, their, their own memory process, right? But if you're talking about people that are 80, it's a different situation, right? So how do you build applications that serve generations of cognitive uh, character? Internationalized societies, it's, people are immigrating all over the world and traveling, right? So we need applications and use cases that support that. Education is changing radically. Uh, we're just on the edge. Uh, there's a gentleman at Stanford who taught a class in artificial intelligence online. So he taught the same class at Stanford uh, in person to a lecture hall. And I think it, he had something like 200,000 students online. And um, I think of the, uh, you can look up the numbers, but I believe that of the 200,000 students, about 200 got every quiz question right, and none of his in-person students did, right? So he, he gave up his position at Stanford to start an online uh, learning community, gave up tenure to start a, a startup. So education is about to radically change. Quantified self-trends, I think a lot of you are aware of that. That's the idea of measuring something personally. And uh, 
the original, there's a lot of work coming out of MIT on that. There was a technology review of you uh, last year about that. There's a local group. So that includes everything from things like the Nike fuel ban to charging out new calories. Uh, and using mobile technology to do that uh, is, is obvious and it's already happening. Um, the other thing is there's a lot of change in society now because we have a lot of communication capability and connection. Change happened more rapidly, right? So the natural reaction to people is going to find refuges from change and kind of reassuring places, right? So how does mobile technology create that, fill that human need? Um, another thing you'll see is uh, because you know, younger parents are technology savvy, they're going to adopt technology to surveil their children, right? And of course, the children are going to find technology to avoid being surveilled, right? <laughs> There's plenty of money to be made, at least off the parents, in use cases for child surveillance of all different kinds. Um, the final thing I want to close with is, uh, I'm not an expert in psychology, but I think it's an interesting space. But a lot of our cognitive characteristics are based on the fact that when we're babies, we were looking at our parents, they were feeding us, they were keeping us warm, and there was this interaction between adult and child. Uh, there's been some research at the University of Washington on language learning. So they've taken children and uh, had video language learning. So there's a face, and there's a sound. And the kids just do not pay attention to it. So a lot of our development, language, emotion, a huge variety of what we consider ourselves to be as, is at, as, as humans, comes from how we were brought up with a close parental relationship in a basically zero to one age, right? What happens? to psychology when machines start entering that space, right? Psychology changes. So again, kind of an interesting thing to think about. So uh, I tried to provide some provocative ideas along with the technology and hopefully didn't use too many, uh, too much jargon, uh, gave you a kind of big system to view, and hopefully inspired you uh, with some questions too. Okay, so we're uh, headed to a wire uh, this month. So um, if you have any questions, um, just uh, line up over here. Don't be scared to get in front of everybody. Everybody's nice here. <laughs> um, actually, I wanted to ask a couple questions first, though. Um, so I don't know a ton about all, all of this, um, but would you say that one of the points of LTE is to sort of give some sort of unification um, to break, to fix the problem of CDMA versus uh, GSM? No. Okay. Uh, LTE was a way to build more efficient networks that were up to date using IP packets like the internet uses throughout the entire wireless network. Uh, opposed to the older networks that use quite a few different unusual protocols. And it's just that LTE won out. Right? And it's, you know, all these are pretty good systems, you know, engineers can argue one is better, but that's not the argument. And unfortunately, with what I said, it's not going to be the standardized and useful way until we get to get radios that are extremely agile. And I don't want to go into radio technology. I believe that's on the software. Uh, the military is doing stuff in that space. I think there's enough money to solve that problem, but it hasn't been done. And then we'll bother with later. <laughs> yes, the <laughs> All right, I have a, a, since everyone wants to be wired all the time, so what's the future of FCC? I think it's paragraph uh, civil code or regulations 47, 922 to 925, basically prohibition of cellular devices while airborne. And it also ties into the FAA regulation 91 to 21. 
and basically the same thing, like you can't use cellular devices. So I know American Airlines, for instance, they have an iPad that's illegal to use in the cockpit nowadays. So now how can they tell like, well, the ice guys guys in the, in the passenger or the you can't use your iPad anymore. How how do you how do you I mean what's what's the future? Uh, I'm actually a believe it or not, people hate me. I'm a supporter of uh, prohibition of wireless devices. I explain technology that remember that big map of all the different frequencies? Uh, wireless devices may be emitting even licensed ones in a variety of those spaces, including the leakage from the sort of the internal parts of the wireless that are part of the transmit and receive process. And so it's not possible to test every system in an aircraft against every possible form of interference. Now the iPad, you know, maybe they'll have a small number to approve. No, I think it's, it's basically any 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 iPad. But no, I'm saying it's approved for the pilots yes, now. Yeah. Maybe in the future they'll say, okay. But it does bring up an interesting point. I think the other thing we're going to see is there's a lot more wireless hacking. Where people are building their own like, transmitters and jammers and all that kind of stuff based on plans on the internet, stuff they order from mouse or it's going to cause problems. Well, I mean, it could I think if they, there is talk of uh, various kind of satellite, you know, connected Wi Fi systems and airplanes. So I think it could creep in that way once they have connectivity they can charge more. Carriers have this valuable bandwidth, but is that bandwidth getting really precious and forcing them to merge? I know ATT tried to buy T Mobile, but the Obama administration repeated. Is it going to be more mergers? Or is the Democratic administration going to prevent that? I mean, I don't know if you have any insight into that. I just think that evolutionary pressure seems to be forcing them to be dumb bit pipes. I don't know if you agree with that, or have any comments on that. Also, I was just curious about Wi Fi. 